On Tech Today, we have a very special guest. I'm here at the Dyson campus in Malmesbury, and we have with us the man himself, Sir James Dyson. What a pleasure to have you with us on the show. Well, thank you for coming such a long way to see us, and it's great to see you. James, when we're talking about um, technology innovation, do you look at particular regions, say India, and perhaps design a product in a particular way? Because technology mm -hmm. solves problems, right? We look at it for solutions. You've asked a really interesting question. I mean, 22 years ago, mm -hmm. our market was substantially in Britain and one or two other places. But since then, we've, we've gone global. We've burst across the globe. And we now have, as I just said, a lot of engineers in, in, the, in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And we've done that because the Asia is the fastest growing region. And it would be arrogant to think that I could sit here, and I don't sit here because I'm often in Singapore and, and Malaysia, um, to think that we could develop products for Asia from here. Uh, so we very much developed them for Asia first, often. Mm -hmm. And our first major market was Japan, and we started making our products a lot smaller uh, for Japan because Japan likes smaller things. And then we found the rest of the world likes smaller products as well. Mm -hmm. They want lighter, smaller products. Um, and now we're in India. Uh, India um, presents some different issues. And I'm sure in the future we'll be designing products with India in mind, as indeed China, Japan, and a lot of the other countries we operate in. So we are prepared to do a product just for one country. Mm -hmm. We've done that already for Japan. We, we did a, pro a very, very small um, cylinder vacuum cleaner for Japan, which we didn't really sell anywhere else. So yes, is it, basic answer to your question is we love doing that. And, and it's interesting because although sometimes we do it specifically for one country, we suddenly discover that other countries want it as well. So it's important to get all those cultural influences. You know, building on that answer, James, when we talk about India, you made a trip to India very recently, mm. and the call back home is to make in India or to manufacture in India. Is that on the cards for Dyson? I can't say yes, but uh, it's very much on the cards, as to use your phraseology. Uh, we would love to do that. Uh, at the moment, we're um, selling only uh, through our own shops and other direct and other means. It's a really interesting and important market for us um, mm -hmm. for lots of reasons. I mean, pollution is one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been making um, home devices to, mm -hmm. to purify the house mm -hmm. for some time. And we've now launched a new product, which is really interesting. Right. Uh, which you put... Uh, you, you wear like this. Have you seen this one? And this is new. And you... You can put this on here. <laughs> There, like that. Right. And I'll just. Sorry, I can't. I, it's, sorry. So, it's so, so good, and I'm listening to music. I can't hear what you're saying, so I've had to take it <laughs> on. But what, what what it's doing in in here? There's there's um, two pumps and and filters. Right. And it takes in air. So it's playing music as well, right? Because it's headphones and very good audio as well. And then it through this device, it's it's pumping the air, purified air, and it it you breathe it through your mouth and nose, mm -hmm. and it doesn't touch your face. So the difference between it and a face mask is that this is, gets all steamy. Absolutely. And you, it smudges your lipstick and all that sort of thing. Whereas uh, this doesn't touch your face, and actually it cools your face. So actually it's very, very pleasant to wear it, particularly in a hot country. Uh, so that, that's an example of um, how we react with a totally, I mean, no one's ever seen anything like this before. Yeah, absolutely. To, to solve a problem that, um, you know, you're walking on streets or sitting on a train or on a subway or a bus, you're breathing in all those traffic fumes uh, and tire dust and whatever, whatever's going on. And this is a way to have clean air and music and not be affected by your environment. So that, that's a, an example of a product that was very much developed with India in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and India's also interesting because it's, it's not a very sophisticated vacuum cleaner market. Uh, as I think you would acknowledge. Um, and uh, dust in a home is a big issue. Uh, not only is it a difficult thing to get rid of, and it goes everywhere, 
but it's also not very healthy, particularly mm -hmm. for people with um, respiratory problems. And then hair care and floor care, but particularly hair care is done really well in India. You know, you have wonderful hair and you want to style it and make it look <laughs> great. So that's done extremely well. A big part of being an inventor essentially is also being able to cope with failure because it's not like you get a bullseye on every shot. There are things that creators, inventors, creative people mm -hmm. try out and they don't necessarily work. How have you dealt with failure in the past? Well, as you pointed out, you, you can't make progress unless you experiment. And if you experiment and do something different, something new, you're almost bound to fail multiple times before you make a success of it. Um, so you, we just have to get used to the fact that our whole day is going to be full of failure, experiments and failure. But I find failure interesting. I find it actually much more interesting than success. Success is there and there's nothing to learn from it. But every failure, you learn something from viscerally. You feel it and remember it. Uh, so I, and I've always worried about education, actually, that um, we teach people to be successful first time, to give the right answer first time. And that's, that is important in quite a few things in life. But if you want to make progress and do something different, you've got to be prepared to fail and have multiple failures and bounce back from it and learn from it before you attain success. And the funny thing is that afterwards, it looks like an act of brilliance, but it wasn't. It was an act of perseverance, <laughs> stamina and perseverance, and a willing to ex willingness to accept failure. And I always say that um, you know, ours is a life of, or my life, and those of my engineers here and around the world, is a life of dissatisfaction because we're not, not satisfied with anything we do. <laughs> we want to do better. We want to make it better. And actually, I think, curiously, that being dissatisfied is actually quite a happy life. You know, James, that's interesting, because in my head, the next question was all about contentment for creative people or for inventors. So mm. biologic, not being content and continuing to hustle is a good thing. Well, I believe it is. And I'm, I'm backed up on this by research done by the University of Exeter who um, looked at various professions and looked at the levels of happiness in those professions. And you're not going to like this, but um, the, being in the media was one of the least happy professions. Medics were about in the middle and engineers were right at the top. Mm -hmm. I've thought about that a lot and, and you know, may, maybe it's this constant change, never being satisfied with what you're doing. You know, when you launch a product, you've got the next one waiting in the wings and the next one behind that. So you, you, you and this, I, must, I mean, what, what you've done is great, what you're launching is great, but you're dissatisfied and you've got a better one coming along, you know? So it's, I suppose, a, a life of, of there's hope because you believe you can do something better. And it's exciting because you, although you're launching one product, you've got the excitement of another one behind you. Um, so may, maybe that's why engineers are happy. Because mm -hmm. although they're permanently dissatisfied and not happy with what they've just done, um, there's always, they know there's more excitement along the way. James, you know, that sort of revelation makes me want to reconsider my career <laughs> choice. But, but, but that said, what you've done at Dyson is massive. And a lot of technology, well, industry people or, or big innovators in this space have done big things in the tech world, especially in the US, but they've done that by going public. Right. This is a company, Dyson, where you've consciously decided to keep it private. Uh, is that something that would change in the coming years? And also, I'd love to understand your rationale for doing so. No, we'll never go public. Um, and, and that's, in, in a way, that's being slightly unambitious in that, presumably, if we went public, we would get a lot of public money and we'd be able to do a lot more. We'd be able to perhaps have done our electric car, which I didn't dare do as a private company. But I prefer it as a private company where we own all the shares and all the decisions are our decisions. And by the way, they're all product-based decisions. Every decision about the company is about the next product or the products we're, we're making at the moment. There's no stock market decision. There's no outside investor decision putting pressure on us to do something or to increase our profits by 30% year after year or whatever it is. So any, any pressure comes from within and I just think that's much healthier and a much happier position to be in. And so we are what you would call a family business. My son works in two offices across there. He's, he's running the business with me, designing the products with me. Um, and my other children are also interested in it and, and take part in it. 
and I hope it'll be a multi-generational family business, but that's not, I can only pass it on once, <laughs> uh, which I hope to be able to do sometime, but um, I'm enjoying it enormously at the moment, so I don't see myself stopping now. But it's, I think, a terrific advantage to be a, a private business. Um, we can also take risks that perhaps the uh, CEO of a public business wouldn't be able to take, and we can take a long-term view. And we can also take um, a view about things like architecture. We can afford to build more expensive buildings, whereas a, a public company would have to build pragmatic buildings because, you know, that's shareholders' money. But I can take the view that we can spend twice as much on a building because I want to build beautiful buildings that will last and which uh, inspire people who come to work in them. Fascinating, James. You mentioned the electric car, and that was something which was very close to your heart. In the future, do you think if you were to revisit that thought, maybe it would pan out differently and maybe we could see attempt number two? We spoke about failure and being resilient. Yes, I would never say no, um, but we, we've been developing new technology batteries and uh, for the car and for our other products. We make a lot of battery products. One of the reasons we didn't continue with the car was that we knew we had to put a huge investment into the battery because gigafactories are very, very expensive things. So uh, I couldn't do both. Um, so maybe when we've developed the battery and got that into production, uh, then one could reconsider it. So it's because we, one of the reasons we want to do it, apart from the fact that we, we've been trying for ages to solve vehicle pollution problems, and, and these are, you know, this is one way of doing it. But we, we used to have a system that collected diesel exhaust pollution on, on the car, but no one in the industry would fit it. Uh, so we, we gave up, um, but coming back in the electric, with the electric car and with these was a way of, of fulfilling our ambition. Um, but we make electric motors, so we developed a very interesting electric motor for the car. Well, there are two of them actually. Um, air pollution and air heating and cooling is something we do, and air filtration is something we're keen on. So uh, the car seemed a very logical thing to do because that's what an electric car is, it's a battery motors and air, and air filtration and heating and cooling and that's that's what we do so it, it may well be something we come back to. Fantastic James, we really hope that we can actually see the prototype or then the final product in the coming years but there's also something I want to talk to you about which is your book mm. which is quite the rage on book stands nowadays. What made you, what was the genesis of the idea of writing a book and what's the response been like? Um, I wrote the book because uh, our first cohort at our university, we've got a university here, so we're training engineers here, and they work part of the time with our great scientists and engineers here, and then the rest of the time we teach them. And they're paid, so uh, we cover their, uh, their education costs, and they receive a salary, so they incur no debt, which I think I'm appalled at the kind of debt level that students are incurring now at such an early point in their life when they want to buy a house and get married and all that kind of thing hanging over them like this horrible debt. The, the book was really to, to coincide with the graduation of the first cohort and I was looking back 50 years uh, to when I graduated and how I viewed the world then and how much it's changed since. Uh, so I wanted to explain to them that um, in, in the book, through the book, that uh, Although they're young, they don't need experience to make huge changes to the world. Um, when I was young, it was certainly thought that you had to be more experienced and no one took you seriously until you, you had 10 years experience under your belt. But the world is moving so fast now and everything's changing so much. Uh, old values have changed and um, the, in the old days, if you were engineering, you had to make it faster and bigger and all those kind of things. Now the opposite is the case. You have to improve the performance, but do it with fewer materials and use less electricity and less water and so on. So it's, you've got to be very, very lean, yet make a better product, which is doubly hard. And what I love about the young generation is that they're really interested in two things. They don't, the windsurfing and all that kind of thing is the sort of sporty bit, is not what young engineers uh, want to work on. They want to work on things that improve the environment, environmental and sustainable products on the one hand, and they want to work on products which help the disabled and the infirm and people with severe diseases and old people. 
Uh, which, and that's absolutely wonderful that that's what they want to do. Uh, so I want to say to them, do it. Don't talk about it. Don't grandstand about the environment. Solve all the problems. Because you've got you scientists and engineers and aspiring scientists and engineers can solve the problems, which is so much better than just grandstanding. James, what an absolute pleasure to have you on Tech Today. And this has been a fascinating chat. Now I'm going to go on and explore the Dyson campus. Thanks again for joining us. Well, thank you for coming all the way to see us. And I'd love to see you soon in India. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.